Hello, everyone. I'm Farrah Warner, the Executive Director of the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you for joining us um, for Metcalf's third installment of our four-part lecture series this June that focuses on the theme of water under pressure, how water systems are being changed and challenged by the global climate crisis. We hope you'll join us next Thursday for our final lecture on June 20th, which will focus on the Great Salt Lake in Utah and efforts to restore it to safe levels. Links to sign up for the lectures will be available in our chat. A note on our Q&A, we will leave time at the end of the lecture for Q&A, but if you do have questions during the lecture, please put them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will and we will try to answer them during the lecture. But please do know that we will have time for Q&A at the end as well. Emily Kribas, our Inclusive Science Communication Specialist, will moderate the chat. And finally, we offer this public space as a forum for ideas. The opinions expressed in our lectures are the speakers alone and are not necessarily the opinions of the Institute or the University of Rhode Island. And thank you to Faith Pritchard for, for giving us a beautiful ASL interpretation today. Thank you. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Regina Rodriguez, a professor of physical oceanography and climate at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, Catarina in Brazil. I'm saying that in English because my Brazilian is not very good. Um, Dr. Rodriguez holds a doctorate in physical oceanography from the Graduate School of Oceanography here at the University of Rhode Island. She is the co-chair of the WCRP, My Climate Risk Lighthouse Activity, and the Clivar Atlantic Region Panel. She is the review editor of the IPCC SRCCL, and she is a member of the editorial board, sorry, she is um, an editorial board member of the Nature Communication Earth and Environment. Her research interests include understanding how in tropical ocean basins interact, and affect the extra tropics leading to extreme events using observation and modeling. I became interested in her work after reading her guest column in Carbon Brief on how the South Atlantic Ocean was overcoming its history as an under-researched ocean, despite playing a critical role in our global climate. As she wrote, the South Atlantic directly affects the climate of many South American and African countries and could drive extreme events such as heat waves, droughts, and floods that lead to water and food insecurity for millions of people. Yet the South Atlantic is under-researched when compared to the North Atlantic, in large part because global powers have historically considered it less geopolitically and economically important. Moreover, the ocean is flanked by low to middle income countries that still struggle to fund the high costs of oceanic, oceanographic research. I am so pleased to have her with us to discuss her research. Dr. Rodriguez, welcome. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for, uh, for this introduction and everybody uh, from the Metcalf Institute for invitation. And I'm gonna share my slides here, just a second. Let's see. Okay, is it okay? Everybody's, um, yes, okay. So yes, because now a little bit, <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't see that. Um, okay, so yes, thank you again. And um, I'm gonna then talk a little bit about then the potential implications of uh, under-researching the South Atlantic for water scarcity in South America. Uh, you know, uh, we we decided to do that because I understand that the water scarcity is the main subject of uh, this annual lecture series. So, so I'm gonna start then well, with what just uh, Farah told us, uh, that in spite of uh, the South Atlantic uh, uh, played a crucial role in the global climate, a, 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 compared to the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic is under research, and mainly due to historical legacy, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, uh, being considered less important geopolitically and economically. Uh, by the global powers, and uh, and the fact that that is flanked by um, low to mid income countries that still struggle to fund uh, the high high costs of uh, uh, oceanographic uh, research. Um, so um, the history of the South Atlantic is one of sporadic 
colonization and economic exploitation. The ocean was largely ignored uh, uh, in the broader history of uh, the wider Atlantic, so much so that the American Cyclopedia called the North Atlantic the proper Atlantic, while referring to the South Atlantic as the Ethiopic Ocean. So meaning maybe the South Atlantic was the proper Atlantic. Um, uh, the Western uh, recorded history of the South Atlantic began uh, in 1500s when Portuguese explorer Pedro Alves Cabral reached uh, what is nowadays the coast of Brazil. Uh, then favor favorable uh, winds and currents made it the South Atlantic ideal for voyages between South America and Africa. Uh, that this is this was during the age of sail. And this enabled the export of agricultural products to Africa, as well as uh, the forced deportation of Africans to South America during the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, interesting South Atlantic from other European powers then began to grow as they uh, sought to gain access to the Pacific via Cape Horn and um, the southernmost point of South America and to the Indian Ocean via uh, Cape of Hope, uh, Good Hope, which is the southernmost uh, point of, of Africa um, here and, and here, right? So you can see the routes uh, uh, at that time of the, the, the main ship, ship uh, routes and uh, the by countries. Um, so in addition, the British and American whalers is exploited the southern South Atlantic whale populations for spermacete, which is an extremely valuable substance used to make candles and cosmetic at the time. So um, with the abolition of the slave trade in 1850, uh, shipping across the South Atlantic decreased. Then the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 shortened the journey time between the West and the East, causing interest in the South Atlantic to further diminish. And then the Panama Canal opened in 1914, allowing direct access to the Pacific, leading to an even greater dominance of the North Atlantic over the South Atlantic in shipping. So, um, and uh, I have to say that the development of oceanography, sorry, just come back here, uh, uh, of oceanography has been historically uh, tied to providing uh, the information needed to increase maritime trade and military superiority. So as such, many advances in, in oceanography uh, of the North Atlantic continue to be made during the two uh, uh, world wars. And, um, and, and, and the North Atlantic received even greater attention during the Cold War with the formation of a, of a NATO, while the nations bordering the South Atlantic remain uh, uh, largely neutral and obviously then uh, not the interest. Um, so now let's talk about the uniqueness in terms of a science, obviously, or importance of the South Atlantic in terms of climate. Um, while all the other oceans transport generally heat from the, the tropical regions to the polar regions, uh, uh, the South Atlantic is the only ocean to transport heat towards uh, the equator. And this is because the South Atlantic supplies large uh, amounts of water to the North Atlantic to replace um, cold waters, uh, cold and dense waters that sink in the Norwegian and Labrador uh, seas as the upper branch of what we call the Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation, AMOC for short. And uh, the AMOC is a major uh, current system in the world's ocean that plays a crucial role in regulating climate. It's like a conveyor belt here, you can see, uh, that redistributes heat around the globe. So, um, so the uh, uh, in addition, in addition, uh, 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 regionally, the South Atlantic variability uh, directly affects uh, uh, the climate of uh, many South American and African countries, as far already mentioned in the introduction, and it can drive extreme events such as heat wave, droughts, floods, and leading to water and food uh, insecurity for millions of people, and resulting in mass migration. But how does it happen? So let's uh, understand a little bit uh, uh, why is that? What is the importance of the South Atlantic uh, for these regions? And uh, so um, I, 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 I'm going to focus obviously in South America with I'm a specialist. And uh, so the precipitation over the Amazon um, in West Africa 
uh, is linked to the inter intertropical convergence zone, or we call ITCZ, and uh, which is this band of a precipitation represented by this black solid line. So the colors here are uh, sea surface temperature uh, in degrees Celsius, and the the, the um, solid lines are precipitation. And so the warmest water in the tropical Atlantic fuel the precipitation. So the ITCZ generally sits over the, the, the warmest water. You can see on top panel that from January to March, uh, summer in the Southern hemisphere, the warmest water are towards the, the, the uh, South Atlantic. And, uh, and, so the, uh, and so is the ITCZ. Uh, so now rain, uh, falls, you can see that uh, the rain falls then over the whole Amazon. In contrast, in from June to August, uh, summer in the Northern Hemisphere, the warmest waters are um, um, in the tropical North Atlantic, uh, here in this bottom panel, and uh, so is the ITCZ. And the uh, rain falls over Western more, uh, over at Western Africa, and not so much on the whole basin of the Amazon, just in the Northern, uh, part of the Amazon. So the seasonal cycle of the ITCZ and associate rainfall is tightly linked to the tropical Atlantic. So now uh, uh, to have a broader vision of uh, the the climate of the South Atlantic, this is this is the moisture. Uh, um, uh, this is the uh, South American monsoon system in the summer, our our austral summer. And the moisture uh, of the Amazon then feeds. Um, so, you see, uh, we started with the Atlantic that, uh, um, you know, is kind of responsible for the, 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 the precipitation over the Amazon. And now the moisture of the Amazon then feeds the South Atlantic convergence zone, this other band of, uh, of a strong precipitation here. And that's uh, also is well established during summer. And so this is the wet season of uh, what we call our uh, South American monsoon system. And uh, you can see that it's linked, the precipitation in all the, uh, most of the South America is linked to the ITCZ and the, the South Atlantic Convergence Zone here. And look at how interesting then this is, because uh, it is, it, if there wasn't the Andes here, all this moisture probably would be lost to the Pacific. So it's very peculiar in South America that because of the Andes, the, the, the moisture from the Amazon um, uh, is, is, uh, can be channeled to the eastern, uh, uh, oops, just go back, uh, the eastern uh, South America during summer, as I showed in the previous slide, but during the winter, actually, it goes towards the southern part of the, the, the South America, and here is Uruguay and even Argentina. So basically, all this moisture that comes from the Atlantic and then uh, goes over the Amazon, uh, feeds all the moisture um, um, in South America. And look at this, this is the rivers here in the middle. And uh, you can see uh, how, how important is the Amazon and, um, and um, it can impact water availability in places including the Pantanal, uh, which is the world's largest wetland, uh, Panama and uh, La Plata River basins, and, and we have the Iguazu Falls and the big cities such in this area, such as Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. So affect the whole South America, right? And ultimately it's linked to the tropical Atlantic. So droughts in the Amazon can occur due to then the failure of the summer monsoon caused by a presence uh, of a high pressure system over the, the Eastern South America. Um, and the, then we don't have the South Atlantic Convergence Zone. Uh, also, if, if the ocean is warmer in the Northern part, then there is a shift of the ITCZ and then the, the rain is away from the Amazon. And the, the third mechanism can be that you can, we can have subsidence of uh, dry air over the Amazon, which it then inhibits uh, a convection or rain. So El Nino, I don't know if you have heard about the phenomenon El Nino, it's a natural uh, phenomenon that is uh, the uh, warm 
characterized by the warming of the Pacific Ocean, it can cause all these mechanisms. You know, the Pacific is here, and when the Nino happens, it's warm this area. So it can actually uh, 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 cause all these three mechanisms. And so we generally have uh, um, droughts uh, over the Amazon uh, during El Nino years. So, um, and uh, so all these factors contribute to the Amazon worst uh, drought on record, which happened last year from June to November, 2023. Um, and obviously it was a El Nino year. The map that I'm showing here, uh, uh, it, it shows the drought index. Um, and we can see not only the spatial extension of this drought, but also the severity uh, this is an index that uh, here you can see the 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 um, scale of it from moderate to exceptional, and we can actually see that uh, for uh, you know uh, over uh, uh, vast areas of the Amazon basin, the drought actually was severe or exceptional uh, or extreme. Sorry, and uh, I should say that this index takes into account both precipitation and evaporation, and this is very important, and I'm going to explain why too because we're gonna get you to climate change with this, just to not let you, uh, you know, wondering why I'm gonna to touch on this subject. So here I explain why evaporation is important and it, it, the overlooked effect of temperature on droughts. So uh, on, on the left, uh, uh, this is what we, we, generally we think about uh, droughts as a lack of precipitation only, and this is what we call uh, meteorological drought. But drought is a combination of a precipitation and evaporation. This is the hydrological cycle. So we can uh, we call this like uh, uh, you can you know you might find the, the expression ecological drought or agricultural uh, drought or hydrological drought. Drought. Sorry. So they occur when evaporation is high and higher than precipitation. So. The point that I want to take is that we can still have a drought with precipitation as fast as evaporation is stronger. And evaporation depends heavily on temperature. And that's how climate change can amplify droughts, because we know that with climate change, we have increasing temperature and uh, uh, is um, uh, causing an increase in evaporation in many places. Um, so now what I'm showing here is, uh, is again, uh, uh, the same map on the left, but on the right, we can, we can see the time series of this same drought index uh, since 1908, uh, when satellite records began. And indeed, it is the most intensive drought on record. We can see that the past, in past El Niños, Right, as we said, El Nino years or El Nino events. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, you know strong droughts over the Amazon, but the droughts are getting uh, uh, worse, and we can see that there is a, a trend of uh, uh, getting more more droughts over the Amazon. So we decided to 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 uh, answer the question: is how much of the 2023 uh, drought can be attributed to climate change? So, and that's the result. This is a work developed by the World Weather Attribution Study. You can find more about them here in this um, uh, uh, site. So this is the uh, kind of a summarize the result of, uh, of uh, the attribution study for the Amazon drought from uh, 2023. And uh, what I wanted you to look at in this graphic is that in the right, uh, uh, the X, uh, X axis here, is precipitation and the y-axis is, is um, uh, evaporation. Um, so um, droughts occur, as you know, when we have low precipitation, right, and high evaporation. So basically, uh, here in the corner, uh, in the left to top corner, colors indicate the classification as we have seen before from moderate D D1 to actually uh, um, uh, exceptional D4. And uh, so the pink dot is, let me just see if I can, yeah. The pink dot here is the 2023 drought. The blue triangle here down, look, 
uh, is how this drought would be in a 1.2 degrees Celsius cooler world from climate models and the pre-industrial levels of a greenhouse gas. And so the drought would be less intense, you see, not D4, but D2, right, would be then moderate, not extreme. And maybe due to the decreased look in evaporation, there wasn't many, many much change on precipitation. This is really uh, due to evaporation and ultimately due to the temperature increase. Now, taking the effect of El Nino, which is this uh, uh, green square, wouldn't have changed much the draw. The draw would be still, the drought, sorry, the drought would be still actually uh, uh, very extreme, right? So uh, the conclusions uh, from this study is that El Nino reduced precipitation, but about the same amount as climate change. However, the strong drying trend was almost entirely due to increased global temperatures. So the, the severity of the droughts currently being experienced is largely driven by climate change. Due to climate change, the likelihood of the meteorological drought occurring has increased by a factor of 10 and the agriculture drought by a factor of 30. So, um, and the devastating impacts, uh, well, I, I, you might have heard, uh, but uh, here I, 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 I pointed for some of the numbers. A portion of the uh, Negro River in the Amazon rainforest near Manaus um, shrank to a depth of just 12.7 meters, its lowest level in 120 years when measurements began. Here in the left panel, you can see how it was in, in 2023 compared to normal conditions in the bottom. In the Lake Tefe, about 500 kilometers west, more than 150 river dolphins were found dead, not because of a low, low uh, um, water levels, but probably because the lake had reached temperatures close to 40 degrees Celsius, which also led to mass mortality of the fish, and in the north and northeast Brazil, eight states have had the lowest July to September precipitation levels in, in uh, 40 years. Many communities in the basin depend on rivers for transportation, as you can see in this picture here, leaving them isolated and thus without access to emergency services and health care. The state of Amazon and more than 20 cities have declared a state of emergency and needed uh, to ration drinking water. The larger riverine system pow uh, powers significant portions of, uh, you can see here the difference too in the satellite images, uh, 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 powers significant portions of uh, affected countries' uh, energy um, through uh, hydropower, with Brazil relying on hydropower for 8% of its electricity, Colombia 79, Venezuela uh, 68, Ecuador and Peru 55, and Bolivia 32%. So the drought is significantly impacting them, uh, um, um, capacities and energy output, and led to power cuts in the region as early as, uh, as, early as June 2023. So in addition to transport dis disruption, this caused a huge economic loss with factories unable to continue production hitting a population with already high levels of poverty. So it's not just a matters of a water scarcity or supply, but this impacts actually transportation, economy, everything, their livelihoods. So, but then you might be wondering what, um, oops, uh, this has to do with the South Atlantic, right? We were talking about the under-researched South Atlantic. And uh, so, and uh, I just said that this drought in Amazon was caused by El Nino, which happens in the Pacific and climate change. But then this climate change, which is, was the biggest factor is related to the South Atlantic and the AMOC. And I'm gonna show you how a little bit. So climate change is threatening the stability of the AMOC. Remember the conveyor belt. As the planet warms, uh, ice sheets in the northern hemisphere are melting, you know probably this better than me, and diluting the salt and sea water with fresh water and preventing cool, dense water from sinking. So this, this slows down this conveyor belt, right? 
So studies show that the, the whole AMOX system is slowing down. And this is some results from a model, see 2000, 2000 here, 2200 and 2400 here, right? So we already have some evidence that this is happening. And uh, even if we, we, even if we um, 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 reduce our cut completely, our emissions, we're probably going to continue this process and then uh, it will eventually stabilize, right? And so, um, IAMOC is considered a tipping element of our climate system, which means that, uh, you know, uh, it can actually tip to another state. And this is really worrying. We don't want that. So, but anyway, so back to this, we, we have already some kind of evidence and from observations, but also modeling that is going to slow down. And what happened with this slowdown? This is what I want to show you. This, this is the sea surface temperature and land temperature in a, this transient peak of a slowing down of the Atlantic here, right? In this, this, this kind of a, when it's going down here. That's how, from models, what we expect by the end of uh, the century. And you look at that uh, uh, the, over the Amazon, it's going to be very warm, and the Atlantic Ocean too, very warm here, right? But look at now this the pattern on this the the right side is the current situation since since June, and the pattern of the SST anomalies it resembles this. You might not think, but it's actually pretty similar, particularly this warming of the tropical. Uh, Atlantic and South Atlantic. So, so from this model, right, we would have a warming of the Amazon and a, 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 a drying. But look at this. This is this is this is now a figure for another model. So this is projection of another climate model simulation. So a panel on the left. Uh, the panels on the left uh, are considering a pessimistic scenario of emission. And on the right, uh, 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 consider an AMOC collapse, right? If we use the same model and then you add AMOC collapse. The top panels is precipitation and the bottom panels are temperature. In this case, for this model, uh, we see a, a different response. The AMOC collapse or slowdown would lead to a cooling, right? A cooling here, temperature, a negative, right? So it's cooling. and. Um, and, and more precipitation over the um, parts of the Amazon. So this is not consistent uh, with what we seen from the previous slide and from these other models. So, so this lack of consistency is due to the uncertainties about the AMOC. So we don't know, the models don't simulate AMOC properly and uh, we don't know, we don't have uh, measurements to understand what is going on. So and that we are back. This is a problem of under-research in the South Atlantic. So we still don't know if the AMOC will slow down, when and by how much. We still don't know the impact of potential slowdown of the AMOC on the Amazon, for instance. And then you know all the implications of uh, the Amazon for the whole South America, for instance, right? And I'm not even talking about the Western Africa, which I'm, you know, I'm not uh, an expert. So we don't consistently measure the South Atlantic Meridian Overton Circulation, which we call SAMOC, then we put an S in front, right? So we don't know. We, don't very, we know very little about it. And, and look at the impact that it can have and our projections that we, we don't know how, the answers for how we're going to be. And it's still, we don't study uh, uh, the, the South Atlantic. So although the scientific community acknowledged the importance of, of, of researching AMOC in general, many international programs have been designed and funded to provide a continuous record of, of the full water column and transbasin uh, fluxes of heat, mass, and, and fresh water. But these programs are mainly focused on the North Atlantic, such as the RAPID uh, 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 program and the OSNAP here in uh, in a um, um, polar region. So the South Atlantic was originally considering solely a passive conduit for the deep waters formed in the North Atlantic. But the South Atlantic is in fact an active part of the AMOC where waters from the Pacific 
and uh, from the Indian Ocean, from the Southern Ocean, all mixed together, and also the deep waters from the um, uh, North Atlantic. So look at this, um, you know, um, it, 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 we can see that, uh, you know, here we have also the temperature of the water and cold waters from, from the Pacific, uh, mixing here with the uh, uh, intrusion of a leakage, we call, of the, the waters from, from the Indian Ocean that is a little bit warmer, and they mix together to, to, to go to the North Atlantic, and then the waters from the North Atlantic comes under. Um, so it's a, it's a mixing, and this is not uh, a passive, um, uh, situation. So, but another obstacle is that uh, uh, the South Atlantic countries are still low, as we already mentioned, to meet income and struggle to fund the high costs of oceanography research. South Atlantic research remain a luxury of uh, the global North. So, uh, so it's a lot of uh, the campaigns are made by, by countries from, from the global North. Uh, oceanography campaigns are a very expensive business and, and present an obstacle then for uh, us scientists from the Global South. For instance, a research vessel can cost anywhere from 35000 to 100000 per day out at sea, dollars I would say. The use of a robotics then or autonomous device as an alternative is limited uh, to the proposed scientific questions about AMOC and also prohibitive in terms of cost, an Argo float costs between 2,000 uh, and 100,000 uh, US dollars, an underwater glider yeah, um, between um, uh, 125 and 150,000 uh, dollars, and an underwater drone has an operating daily cost you can buy, but they 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 rent so and the, the operating daily cost is uh, two thousand five hundred dollars. So this yeah. is really impossible for scientists from the global south to 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 um, do it. So, but the recognition of uh, the importance of uh, the South Atlantic uh, led to the creation in two thousand seven of a group of scientists dedicated to unveil uh, the sorry the um, uh, South Atlantic role on the AMOC, which I already said we call SAMOC, right? So in spite of all these obstacles that I mentioned, the success of the SAMOC initiative can be explained by its community, which is driven by a shared vision, well-defined roles, and grassroots uh, sharing of resources rather than uh, by unified pools of uh, funding, as generally is done for the North Atlantic. And so this is a, this allowed the equal participation of scientists from the global south and the global north. And additionally, there is a, a also a gender balance with women leading many of the Samoc research crews as a principal investigators. And uh, I'm really proud of that. And um, so ocean science in South Atlantic then refutes this is historical legacy and mirrors the diversity of its own waters. For all it represents, it, it is therefore imperative that we continue supporting ocean science in South Atlantic. So, and I'm going to stop here. Don't know how long it takes. And I would like to thank everybody again for inviting me to to the lecture. Thank you so much, Regina. We have time for questions. Um, so again, just to let people know, you'll see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in now. And while we wait, Regina, I have a, a question for you. This is um, coming from a non-scientist. So there were a lot of headlines last year um, and potentially will be more this year, um, of the high temperatures of the oceans um, in and around Florida. People were talking about them as being sort of bath-like. Um, is that a result of what is happening in the South Atlantic? Or is, um, I'm just wondering as a journalist and a non-scientist. Yeah, I mean, we can still say, I have seen actually even an ocean science meeting and, 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 and in a, in other um, um, conference, a few work about it, and it's not conclusive um, yet. 
Some people say that it's there, just the atmosphere, but it's too persistent, in my opinion, to be the atmosphere. And as I, I showed in one of my slides, it's really similar to uh, what we expect from, from some models, uh, the slowdown of the AMOC. I, I have a feeling, it's not that I can say now, that it might be doing, uh, due to the slowdown of the AMOC. The, this this really warming of uh, the whole uh, kind of a tropical subtropical North Atlantic, including Florida and 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 Caribbean and all that area. Give me now. We're probably going to see a lot of the work coming uh, to explain that. I have a question or a clarification on in the chat about the role of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the distribution of water? Um, well, uh, I mean, the, the Atlantic Ridge is there and then it, it changes the, the weight of the currents, but it's a fixed thing. It's not something that is changing. Or So uh, the circulation of the deep uh, uh, South Atlantic is the way it is, obviously, because it has the, the Atlantic Ridge. But uh, the uh, ridge, sorry, but uh, the, the the changes that we are seeing and that we are interested in, in understanding is something else, because the ridge is there, um, you know, and doesn't really change only in uh, long geological time. Obviously, when we had the, the plates uh, moving, but not for our kind of uh, you know short time scales that we are interested in of a centuries. We have another question that is talking about um, back to the hydrological cycle in the Amazon. Um, I think they wanted to know like how much sort of like, how do we sort of balance the cycle a bit more? Um, like what percentage of the tree canopy is needed to maintain a healthy hydrological cycle? Yeah, so um, 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 I didn't really, wanted to get too much into the, the details of uh, the Amazon as a tipping point because uh, as a tipping element because you know it was a lot of information already but um, that there are some uh, physical um, variables precipitation particularly temperature that if we cross some limits we might um, lower precipitation and, and high temperature which is exactly what climate change is doing that will affect the health of uh, of the forest, particularly also because we have a lot of deforestation, uh, man-made deforestation, and this can lead to actually tipping to a savanna-like of a vegetation. And uh, people say generally that is twenty percent. If we lose twenty percent of the Amazon, it could um, tip to a savanna. But mo most recently studies are showing that uh, you know you might not have a whole um, the whole forest tipping, but actually more regionally. And we, the arch of the deforestation, which is the southern part of the Amazon, um, you can also see, uh, you can already see, see signs of a, of, a, of a kind of tipping, but um, we might be lucky in the sense that it's not gonna happen uh, on the whole basin. It's gonna be more regional. Um, if obviously we <laughs> we stop uh, deforestation and we also reduce the emission. Um, as we wait for a few more questions to come in, um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the creation of the Samak community. How did that come together? How um, it sounds, you know, and and sort of the gender diversity. I wonder if you could talk about how that community came together. Yeah, um, so there were uh, 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 a few groups that are already doing research in, in the South Atlantic, uh, particularly the Germans and the French the, and also the Americans. And obviously, uh, when they each come to, to the South Atlantic, you have to also um, um, sometimes stop in Brazil or in South Africa or the places to, you can't just do the research. And then you have to entrain uh, uh, researchers from these countries. And uh, we, we, like Brazilians and uh, uh, um, 
researchers from the Argentine, uh, from Argentine, also used to to go. So we we started, you know, uh, working together as we could, and uh, and when this thing of the AMOC uh, got more prominent, and uh, we started. Uh, noticing that we have to understand it because in this conveyor belt, including the South Atlantic, and we started changing this, and then and there was already monitoring in the North Atlantic, so we decided to mimic and try to make it a, a monitoring. She, nowadays, uh, a lot of uh, research is showing that actually it's better to 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 uh, monitor it in the South Atlantic rather than the North Atlantic. It's, it's much more influence. It can actually you know some research shows that but still obviously uh the countries that uh, has the funding to do that and uh, the know-how to do that is in the north atlantic it's really hard for 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 even the scientists from us or europe to justify do research in a in, so far away from 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 the kind of a, you know location you see i mean it's not really the fault of uh, the, the researchers is to say, oh, wow, we don't want to, I mean, they understand that. I think everybody understands the importance of the South Atlantic, but it's really difficult to convince the funding agency to go uh, there. And it's much more expensive to get the ship and go uh, further to the South Atlantic. Um, so, and then, you know, so we, that's why it came about like that, because we had to really do little pieces. There was no call, no, funding call for the South Atlantic, you know, so people start trying to, to get a little bit of money from, you know, as we could and put it together. And even though limited in terms of a resource, but on the other hand, it gave, gave us a little bit more freedom. And so groups that maybe otherwise wouldn't manage to, to, to get this, this, this grants, big grants, awards, from big calls, then you know we try to go around and find ways, different ways to get money, and we manage. And then uh, you know, and then the bias uh, to against women or whatever it, it was gone. So and that was positive in that respect. We have less money, but because we are not going through the main, um, I guess um, you know big calls, big funding agency and everything, which he, you know, inherit, it, it, it has this bias, I think. Um, it, in the end, it wasn't like on purpose, but in the end, um, that's how, when I went to a meeting, some of the meeting, and I realized that most of the PIs were women. That's how I decided to write that piece in Carbon Brief and then do a special collection. And the review paper of uh, the special collection was just, uh, 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 altered by women, which in physical oceanography is it's something because you know it's engineering is the sea go out to sea is very traditionally a man uh, field actually. Um, again, I Maybe. will. Yeah, thank you, Regina. Um, again, I'll suggest to um, our audience that they put any questions that they have in the in the Q and A function. Um, so what's next for you, Regina? What is what are you looking forward to? Do you have something on the horizon that you're looking forward to exploring in the Southern Atlantic? Yes, I'm uh, looking at uh, extreme events in the South Atlantic now and the link with actually extreme event on land, which what we call compound extreme events, because uh, you know we have uh, um, uh, marine heat waves uh, now. We know and, uh, uh, that uh, it's extreme events of, uh, of uh, warming in the ocean, and you can see that why is happening. And the South Atlantic is one of uh, the ones that uh, is warming in a fast pace. And uh, together with that, we have acidification. And so all this uh, puts a, a huge pressure in, in marine ecosystem. So that's what we are doing now. I'm studying now the, the um, uh, overlap of uh, extreme events of acidification with extreme events of uh, warming and actually low productivity in the South Atlantic and how this can affect the ecosystem. We have a couple more questions in the chat. And there was one um, kind of, we talked about like SAMOC and this like regional sort of community that y'all are building. Um, 
and even with your talk, like talking about, like you were very clear with the limitations of like um, some of the technologies. Do you, have you found that like um, there are any sort of like productive collaborations between the North and the South to sort of fill uh, that need? And I'll add a little bit onto it because you mentioned like West Africa as well being part of this cycle. Are there like other efforts too to like take this um, and expand the community a bit and communicate across all these different regions? Yeah, so that picture that I showed with all that women actually, and uh, that I mentioned that there are PIs from the projects is um, we have it from France, from US, uh, from Noah actually, from from the US and uh, from Germany, from Argentina and from Brazil and from South Africa. So they are all women PIs and they are from the global North and the global South. And this is what is the beauty of it, you know. I don't wanna that uh, obviously, you know, uh, I wouldn't like it that it would become just a global south business. I think we have to interact uh, is is healthy and and for everyone. And it, it is what has happened. So we we are actually working together, the global north and south. It's not just a, um, we wouldn't be able to do by ourselves. And I don't think we would. Uh, 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 we need we need the, the different views, the different perspectives, the different. Uh, um, uh, uh, how do you say kind of, uh, um, you know, know how, um, you know, you have uh, like a much more advanced equipments and better, better infrastructure, but we have a little bit sometimes creativity because we have to do with less money. And so this all together, it, it, that makes uh, uh, fun and, and I think it pushes even forward uh, things. That's amazing. Um... Yeah, tr now transitioning sort of, I think a lot of our audience, like we don't have like, we're not necessarily doing this type of research and we understand like our contributions to climate change as well. So this one, this question is from Paula and it's on a more like individual level. Um, and it asks, how can we talk about the importance of the Amazon in a way that people will understand? Many purchase products from the Amazon, palm oil for one, beef as another, without realizing the damage that purchasing these products have on the South Atlantic. Yeah, this is really uh, it's a very good question. And uh, Brazil uh, doesn't have too much problem with the palm oil. This is a, but this is, this is a huge problem in another uh, uh, rainforest, um, but not in the Amazon. The Amazon is, is really soy and, and cattle, I mean, red meat. So um and uh, and uh, so even though like say the european union uh, has now for instance uh um putting some 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 uh law that um you have to track this importation of meat and soy and see if it, if it comes from the forested area they will not buy but uh, most of our exportation is to China and other countries that probably uh, don't have the same restrictions. So this is a problem, um, you know, and we know that uh, consuming more or less, less red meat is a good thing in terms of emission, but because of the pressure on, on the Amazon, particularly in the forestation, which is a big emission, like 40% of Brazil uh, emissions comes from the forestation. Um, so it's huge. You know, and we are the fifth, I think, country in, in emission. So this is this is play a huge role, and not mention obviously the pressure on us on the on the whole ecosystem, but just uh, you know in terms of actually the impact on climate change itself. And um, um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I don't know if it appeals to people to talk about how how much the Amazon actually is is important globally, not just regionally, but all that I showed, uh, but also impacts the the the, the whole climate. Uh, you know, these areas that I showed that we call that the arch of the deforestation. Um, um, field work already shown that uh, in that area, the, the the Amazon is a, is not anymore a sink of a carbon from the atmosphere. A sink is uh, absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. It became a source now of carbon. So it's actually not even doing the job 
that we expected of uh, absorbing carbon and taking out carbon dioxide from the 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 the, um, the atmosphere. And this is because it's so degraded that uh, it's actually now being a source. And this this affects it globally, you know, not just the region. This is you know, it's climate change. Thank you. Um, so far, we don't have another question. Um, Regina, do you have any final comments that you would like to make? Anything you you would love for our audience, particularly the audience here, but this will also be on our YouTube channel. So um, anything you'd like people to be aware of or actions that they could take or things to think about? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have to know what we buy and what we consume and um, you know and we really if we can choose not products that are related to the forestation um, or actually not even consume that much you know um, on climate change and um, and um, in that respect right um, um, that will help but um, uh, we all have to have the conscience about climate that is uh, ha happening and uh, you know and then we have to find our solutions that isn't a silver bullet thing uh, we know now that you know and uh, so yeah I don't know <laughs> um thank you so much um we do Emily do you want to take this last one um it's not a question but uh yeah, not really a question, but Douglas Mitchell says, interesting presentation, and hello from your old grad school office mate. <laughs> yeah, he was my office mate. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Regina. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Emily, for moderating the Q&A, and to Faith for our American Sign Language translation, and to the Metcalf team for all of your support. Um, I hope you'll sign up for next week's lecture. Um, and thank you again. Thank you for having me here. Thanks. <laughs>